mercy. More and more people are talking about it in the context of the masses of Americans we incarcerate. But is mercy enough? Today on The Laura Flanders Show, a man who's done a lot to push this debate to the forefront, Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama. And later in the show, we find out how your community can be part of his history marking project. All that and a few words from me on the high cost of isolating not just our prisoners, but our prisons. Welcome to our program. Our next guest has dedicated his life to work at the intersection of race, poverty, and the law. Brian Stevenson is the founder and executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama, dedicated to helping the poor, the incarcerated, and the condemned, also us. Under his leadership, he's won major legal challenges, eliminating excessive and unfair sentencing, exonerating innocent death row prisoners, confronting abuse of the incarcerated and the mentally ill, and aiding children prosecuted as adults. Brian's initiated major new anti-poverty and anti-discrimination efforts that challenge the legacy of racial inequality in America, including major projects to educate communities about slavery, lynching, and segregation. Among his many awards are the MacArthur Foundation Genius Prize and 16 honorary degrees. He's the author of the critically acclaimed bestseller, Just Mercy, which is recently out in paperback. Brian, welcome to the program. Glad to have you. Thank you. Delighted to be here. So, Brian, with all of your many, many degrees and books, and you're a genius after all, <laughs> look into the future for me. And how far do you have to look to see a society, our society, dealing with this question of justice differently? Well, I think it's in different components. I think the phenomenon of mass incarceration is something we could correct in a very short period of time. It took us 40 years to get from a prison population of 300,000 in 1972 uh, to 2.3 million today. Uh, I actually think that if we end this misguided war on drugs, if we begin to deal with drug dependency and drug addiction as a health issue mm -hmm. rather than a crime issue, if we eliminate mandatory sentencing, if we commit ourselves uh, to helping people recover, and uh, to correct and to rehabilitate, I think we could cut the prison population in this country in the next six to eight years. Mm -hmm. uh, there, we've got a million people in jails and prisons who are not a threat to public safety, who are there for simple possession of marijuana or for writing a bad check of $100. And I think we could actually, in a very short period of time, bring down the prison population by a million. We spent $6 billion on jails and prisons in 1980. We spent $80 billion last year. So if we cut the population by 50%, we'd arguably have about $40 billion to then spend on the other aspects of our justice system. But we would still, and the New York Times pointed out recently, we would still be incarcerating more people than anyone else in the world, even if we did away with the drug war and, and the death penalty. Uh, absolutely. We still have a lot more work to do. Uh, but I think if we got to the point where we brought down the prison population and we realized that we were no less safe, and we realize we don't have to engage in the kind of excessive, punitive, harsh responses that have defined our nation mm -hmm. over the last 40 years, then I think it would be easier to imagine ending the death penalty and eliminating uh, life without parole. But I also think it would be important to have those dollars redirected into a new kind of intervention, mm -hmm. where we start treating all of the children living in households uh, where they are born into violence and they're living in violence and they're chased by violent gangs and they're traumatized. Uh, where we'd start investing into solutions to deal with the structural poverty yeah. and structural despair. You know, I work in communities where I talk with 13 and 12 year old kids who honestly tell me that they don't expect to be free by the time they're 21. And it's not an irrational fear. The Bureau of Justice now reports that one in three uh, black male babies born in this country is expected to go to jail or prison. So I think if we created a new environment uh, that is fueled by the reduction in jails and prisons, we could start talking about some of these other issues. And I, I am persuaded that in my lifetime, we could imagine, we could actually achieve a very different environment mm. when we start talking about social justice. All right, so I want to get back to the new environment yes. and the 40 years. But yes. before that, you, your book, Just Mercy, is rooted in people's stories. Mm. And, I, and I wanted you to tell just a couple. Mm. Um, early on in your career, somebody tells you, um, capital punishment. Those who don't have the capital get the punishment. Mm. How does the story of Walter McMillan sort of 
illustrate exactly that point. Yeah. Well, I do think one of the challenges that we have in this country is that we have a criminal justice system that treats you better if you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent. Yeah. Wealth, not culpability, shapes outcomes. And Walter McMillan was an indigent uh, black man in uh, South Alabama who was wrongly accused of a murder. Uh, and he was largely accused because he was having an affair with a young white woman. He was African American. And, um, uh, you know, they couldn't solve the crime. And the pressures that we now put on law enforcement to solve crimes, to arrest the bad person, are so extreme that frequently they don't care whether that person is guilty or innocent. That's what happened to Mr. McMillan. And even though he was at uh, his home raising money for his sister's church with dozens of other people who could verify his innocence, uh, he was arrested, put on death row before trial, uh, stayed on death row for 15 months before taken to trial, convicted. And just stop for a second, because people may say, huh, what do you mean? Why was he there before he was even convicted? The, they, they wanted to create a narrative about his guilt, his dangerousness, and so they actually uh, put him on death row, and so the papers would say, death row defendant Walter McMillan will be arraigned next week, will be uh, prosecuted next week, and it created this idea that he's so dangerous that we can't even keep him in the normal jail. They coerced people to testify falsely against him. Uh, they took him to trial. Uh, all of the people who were with him, uh, who t came forward to say he's not guilty, were ignored, yeah. and based on the testimony of one or two people, they convicted him. They actually gave him a sentence of life without parole, the jury, uh, but the elected trial judge, whose name was Robert E. Lee Key, uh, overrode the jury's verdict and imposed the death penalty. And of course, the irony of Mr. McMillan's case was that it takes place in Monroeville, Alabama, which is the community where Harper Lee grew up and wrote the famous, beloved American novel, To Kill a Mockingbird. And we love that story in this country. We read it. If you go to Monroeville, they celebrate it. All the streets are named after characters in the book. Uh, they put on a play about it each year. They are preoccupied with that story, but were completely indifferent to the plight of an innocent black man being wrongly convicted. And as you point out, he was also barely literate. Barely literate. Like many people, he was the children of sharecroppers. Uh, there were no schools for black kids in the community when he was a little boy. Uh, and uh, he was demonized behind this narrative. The victim was white, he was black. That's one of the challenges of our system. Uh, you're about 11 times more likely to get the death penalty if the victim is white than if the victim is black. Uh, and all of that fed into this wrongful conviction. Uh, we got involved, and the thing that was compelling to me uh, was that people of color would come up and say, Mr. Stevenson, it would have been so much better if he'd been out in the woods hunting by himself when this crime took place, because at least then we could entertain the possibility that he might be guilty. But because we were there with him, we feel like we've been convicted too. And it was almost as if this was uh, a community punishment. Everybody in the black community felt burdened by this conviction and sentence. Well, you just mentioned Robert E. Lee, community punishment, yeah. the history of America. This is not just about the last 40 years. No, it is absolutely not. We in this country have all been infected by our history of racial inequality. I think we're all compromised by this narrative of racial difference uh, that was created during the time of slavery. And if we're going to free ourselves, if we're going to cure this infection, we're going to have to talk about these errors in our history that we have not yet addressed. America is unique in some respects. There was slavery all across the world. But in most countries, slavery was a transitional status. It could happen to anyone. It was not permanent. Mm -hmm. They were societies with slaves. America became something different. We became a slave society. We made slavery a permanent, hereditary status tied toward race. And we tried to legitimate it by making up this ideology of white supremacy. We came up with a narrative of racial difference where we argued that black people aren't as good as white people. And we used that narrative to sustain and legitimate slavery. No, Scott Nakagawa on this program has said we are also the country that created its capitalist system mm -hmm. out of slavery. Well, well, you cannot understand the economic infrastructure of America, the economic progress of America, without uh, understanding the role that slavery played in that development, which is why you needed something to help you reconcile owning other human beings uh, with the continuation of this institution, and the ideology of white supremacy was that something. And unfortunately, when slavery was outlawed in the mid-19th century, we didn't deal with the narrative of racial difference. We didn't deal with the ideology of white supremacy. And it's why I argue the 13th Amendment doesn't talk about that. Yeah. It just talks about involuntary servitude. The Emancipation Proclamation doesn't talk about that. And it's why I've argued that slavery didn't end in 1865. I think it evolved. It turned, it turned into decades where you had this kind of racial terror and this hierarchy 
uh, and this ideology of white supremacy manifesting itself in new ways. Ways that were both economic, uh, sharecropping, tenant farming, uh, no education and uh, opportunities for people of, who were formerly enslaved, and political, no rights to vote, and social. We're going to keep you down here because that's how we maintain this narrative of racial difference. And it couldn't have happened with just laws mm -hmm. or just analysis. It needed something to back it up, and that backing it up came in the form of lynching. Terrorism, the mm -hmm. violence that people of color would experience any time they did anything to shake or to contradict uh, this ideology of white supremacy. So is the death penalty in our mass incarceration system our way of lynching now? Well, I think it's a continuation of that narrative. I mean, we first of all traumatized people of color for decades, and then we codified systems that segregated them uh, and humiliated them. And then when we gave people the right to vote, we actually began using the presumption of dangerousness and guilt that is shaped during the era of slavery uh, to kind of shape the way we think today. So you can't understand these current issues of police violence or the death penalty or over-incarceration of people of color without understanding that there is a presumption of dangerousness that gets assigned to every black and brown person in this country. So what are you going to do? Well, I think we have to change the landscape. We have to change our relationship to this history. We've practiced silence and denial for 150 years. Nobody talks about slavery. Nobody talks about lynching. You start talking about race and people get nervous. You start talking about racial justice and they're looking for exits. And we've got to change this habit of denial and silence. And so I want to elevate that legacy. I want to mark the spaces where slavery was active. I want to put markers and monuments at the places in this country where the slave trade flourished. I want to mark all of the lynching spots in America. I don't think you should be able to go anywhere in this country where a lynching took place and not know where you are standing. I want to change our relationship to the history of segregation. I want us to talk about what humiliation on a daily basis did to people. We've got black people in, North, in the North and the Midwest, in New York, in Boston, Chicago, Cleveland, Los Angeles, Oakland, and people don't appreciate that those people of color came to these communities not as immigrants looking for new economic opportunities, but as refugees and exiles from terror in the South. So not just take down the Confederate flag, but put up some other markers. A absolutely. If you go to South Africa, there's a recognition that they could not recover from apartheid without truth and reconciliation. In Rwanda, the same thing. Go to Germany. You go to Berlin, and there are markers and stones to mark the spaces where families were abducted and taken to the camps. They want you to go to the camps and reflect soberly on the history of the Holocaust. We do the opposite. We could talk for a very long time, yes. but I want to touch on two things. One, your book emphasizes, and I appreciate it deeply, gender. Yeah. Um, there are some cases there I'd love, I'd love you just to mention. I think sure. of Trina Garnett, some yeah. of the others. Yeah. Um, if we told the story through the eyes of women, mm. could we change the narrative a bit? I absolutely think we could. I mean, we've increased the percentage of women being sent to prison by 640% in the last 20 years. 70% of these women are single parents with minor children. You're much more likely to go to prison if you're the child of an incarcerated parent. We're still talking about women of color, mostly. Well, yeah, mostly, yeah. And we've demonized women. We've made being poor and a mother and has struggling uh, this kind of crime. And that has to change. And I've seen it with the way we've uh, dealt with children. We're one of the countries, only countries in the world that condemns children to die in prison. The United States has 3,000 children sentenced to die in prison through life imprisonment without parole. And many of them are young girls, like Trina Garnett, who's been condemned in Pennsylvania. And so I do think there is a way in which if we begin to recognize our commitment to people who have been marginalized, excluded, who are vulnerable, that changes the way we have to think about how justice is imposed. So that gets me to just mercy mm. and the question of just, mm. as in sufficient. Given everything you've said, is it credible to believe that, or is it possible to believe that an institution that has come from the system that you have described of slavery and segregation and our economy is reformable? Mm. Or do we not instead rather need to overhaul it entirely? Mm. I guess what I'm asking is where do you stand on prison abolition? Yeah, well, I think both things are gonna be needed. I mean, our system has unquestionably dramatic systemic deficits, but it has also uh, yielded some things. I'm sitting here because it was this legal system mm -hmm. that created a pathway out of bondage uh, for people who had been uh, burdened with this legacy. I, I, am, I don't make any you know, qualms about acknowledging that I am a product of these rulings that created equal educational opportunities. At the same time, we are going to have to shake it fundamentally. I believe that we're all more than the worst thing we've ever done. I really do. My clients have taught me that. I think if someone tells a lie, they're not just a liar. Uh, 
If somebody takes something that doesn't belong to them, they're not just a thief. I think even if you kill somebody, you're not just a killer. And if we get this society to think about the other things people are, even when they've made a mistake, we begin a different conversation. And then that system begins to respond to the demands of justice, the demands of mercy, the demands of compassion. Nobody listening wants to be judged by their worst act, wants to only be known by the worst thing they've done. And we all want mercy. But the way that works is that if we want mercy, we have to give mercy. If we want compassion, compassion, we have to show compassion. And this country has made a habit of denying mercy and compassion to the black, the brown, the un undocumented, women, the mentally ill, children, the disfavored, and then wanting it for itself. And you cannot function that way. Brian's book, Just Mercy, is just out now. Brian Stevenson, thank you so much. You're welcome. In 1619, when the first Africans were brought to the British colonies by ship to Jamestown, Virginia, they held the legal status of servant. But as the region's economic system became increasingly dependent on forced labor, we descended into slavery. The institution of American slavery developed as a permanent, hereditary system centrally tied to race. Millions of black people were forcibly taken from Africa crammed on ships and brought to the Americas through a dangerous and deadly journey that crossed the Atlantic. Millions died. Once on our shores, slavery deprived the enslaved person of any legal rights or autonomy and granted the slave owner complete power over the black men, women, and children legally recognized as property. An ideology of white supremacy, a narrative of racial difference was created to rationalize and justify the continuation of slavery. American slavery was often brutal, barbaric, and violent. In addition to the hardship of forced labor, enslaved people were maimed or killed by slave owners as punishment for working too slowly, visiting a spouse living on another plantation, or even learning to read. Enslaved people were also sexually exploited. The United States Congress finally banned the importation of slaves from Africa in 1808. Slavery was widely considered a gross human rights violation, yet enslavement was retained and persisted. The 1808 Declaration caused the demand for slave labor to skyrocket in the Lower South, and the domestic slave trade grew to meet this demand. Between 1808 and 1860, the enslaved population of Alabama grew from less than 40,000 to more than 435,000. Slave traders chained African Americans together in coffles and forced them to march hundreds of miles from the Upper South to the Lower South. Steamboats carried slaves along the Alabama River. Rail routes constructed with slave labor brought hundreds of enslaved people to Montgomery, Alabama every day, turning the city into one of the largest slave trading communities in the United States. Enslaved people would be paraded up Commerce Street to slave warehouses and slave depots. The city's slave market was at the Artesian Basin, now known as Court Square. Enslaved people of all ages were auctioned along with livestock, standing in line to be inspected. Public posters advertising the sale of slaves included gender, age, skill, complexion, owner's name, and price. Slavery in America traumatized and devastated millions of people. Husbands and wives, parents and children could not protect themselves from being sold away from each other. Enslaved families were separated at an owner's or auctioner's whim, never to see each other again. The domestic slave trade separated nearly half of all enslaved people from their spouses and parents. In 1833, the Alabama legislature banned free black people from residing in the state, meaning that enslavement was the only legally authorized status for African Americans. Even as the Civil War raged, slave trading in Montgomery flourished well into the mid-1860s. After the Confederacy's surrender in 1865, Congress passed the 13th Amendment, which prohibited slavery nationwide except as a punishment for crime. But in many former slave states, slavery did not end. It simply evolved. Southern whites, angry after losing the war, targeted black people who were largely abandoned by the federal government in the 1870s. For decades, black men, women, and children were tortured, terrorized, and killed by mobs and violent lynchings, oppressed by a system of racist laws and customs. 
For another 100 years, black people were racially segregated, denied the right to vote, education, and basic dignity. They were humiliated, beaten, or killed for minor offenses or for protesting. The civil rights movements of the 1950s and 60s helped to end legally authorized racial segregation, but racial bias still persists. Today, a presumption of guilt is assigned to many people of color who are disproportionately arrested, convicted of crimes, and sent to prison. African Americans are six times more likely to be sentenced to prison for the same crime as a white person. One in three black males born today can expect to spend time in prison during his lifetime. Police violence against black people is so epidemic that civil rights demonstrations have shut down cities across the U.S. as thousands of people march to protest police brutality. Many states celebrate the era of slavery with Confederate holidays and by honoring the defenders and architects of slavery while ignoring the history of enslavement. The Equal Justice Initiative believes that racial bias remains a serious problem and is a direct and lasting legacy of American slavery and our failure to deal with the history of racial injustice. The Equal Justice Initiative seeks to foster an honest conversation about the legacy of slavery, about mass incarceration, and racial inequality, and how it still affects millions of people today. We can confront and overcome bias and discrimination. Please join us in this conversation so that we can move forward together. For more information about the work of the Equal Justice Initiative, you can check out our website. The state of California recently conceded that its policy of keeping prisoners in isolation demanded an overhaul. Now, can we overhaul our system of isolating our prisons? As the prison activists and lawyers who forced California to change made clear, human beings are social animals. Isolation breaks spirits and souls and minds. Well, so too, isolating our prisons from the centers of our body politics breaks our society's connection to that institution, an institution our societies have created. As MacArthur Genius Award-winning public defender Brian Stevenson writes, he was already a lawyer before he first met a death row inmate. The fight against social segregation stopped too soon, he says. We came to accept that isolation and segregation were wrong for homes and schools, but we caught our prisoners off to the most remote places we can find. We're still at it. As Brian Stevenson's grandmother, the daughter of slaves, told him, you can't understand the most important things in life from a distance. You have to get close. Well, at this point, the state of New York's incarceration systems, less about justice than about distributing public money from downstate to up, it's a development scheme. But the social cost of this removal in this state and many others is measured in the invisibility of people in prison, invisible from our consciousness. Changing the status quo sometimes seems impossible, but it's made more so by how intangible it is. When the people caught up in it, both prisoners and staff, rarely actually talk to us. We, the voters who permit this mass incarceration system to continue. When we sentence offenders, what we assume is that everyone in the community is a victim of the crime. Hence all that talk about the state versus Jane Doe and the people versus etc. Well, how about we be consistent? 2.3 million in prison, 6 million people on probation and parole, we're shooting, gassing, hanging, electrocuting, and poisoning hundreds of people and keeping more languishing on death row. We're the only country in the world that locks up kids in isolation. We make terrible mistakes, first and foremost permitting race, poverty, and illness to lead to death or lock up for life. Proximity could change this. As Stevenson's grandmother said, we need to break ourselves, not just our prisoners, out of isolation. You can find all my interviews and reports at our website, lauraflanders.com. Write to me, tell me what you think. Laura at lauraflanders.com. <laughs>
Thanks. What would our world look like today if our media showed us as much collaboration as they do competition? What if we got to meet people making change right here, right now, in all sorts of ways we're usually told are impossible? Subscribe today to The Laura Flanders Show for in-depth interviews with forward-thinking people. Smarts, not sound bites, every week, right here. Subscribe and thanks. This week, we talk with anti-racist author Tim Wise. So the stuff that white folks have on their plate is in part being cooked up in the kitchen of white supremacy. And hear from New Orleans public school students who are taking back their schools. Then you cut into the stubbornness of my heart and season it with love, laughter, memories, and heartache. It's all coming up right here. Stay tuned. What does it take to go from a moment to a movement? Today we're dedicating the entire Laura Flanders show to a special report from Baltimore. People in Baltimore are tired of just sitting idle, waiting for change to happen, so we're going to make change happen ourselves. Whether it's through breaking the curfew, civil disobedience, or daily protest, whatever it is, we're going to do it. 